Hello, Yeshua Network. Nathan Wheeler here with day 32 of our 40-day prayer challenge. If you have not begun it, if you don't even know about it and you want to learn more, uh, we have links in the description of this video that go to the YouTube playlist for the entire 40-day holiness challenge. That's right, people from all over the world have got together and we edify and strengthen each other and fellowship with one another, encourage one another uh, over these 40 days through this fellowship at Yeshua Official on Facebook. And we desire to remove as much sin from ourselves as we possibly can. Why? Because that's exactly what the Lord commanded us to do. It's the reason for the cross. It's the reason for the entire Bible. The Lord is constantly commanding us to step away from the ways of the world, from the ways of our own desires and ambitions, and to step into his and to surrender to him moment to moment to moment so that he may enter into us and give us life more abundantly, a life filled with all the fruits of the spirit and all the promises that he has given us and they are amazing promises today is another day where we're going over what the lord has uh, proclaimed to us uh, what the what it is to come into the the walking with the lord to what will be the results of surrendering our day to the lord so we got more passages about that today and then we also have some passages that just talk about the reality of it what is, what is it really like to uh to pick up your cross and follow the lord uh, some of us think it's going to be smooth sailing, but it's not always smooth sailing. So, uh, yeah, we, we are going to be addressing that as well. So all the passages that we will be speaking about today are in the description of this video. So you can go to the description of the video, whether you're watching it on Facebook or on YouTube, and you can check that out. We also have our next meetup coming up. I know, plugs in the beginning here. I don't normally do this, but I do want to... Um, I do want to plug that there is another meetup coming in Boise, Idaho, July 24th and 25th. Uh, there is a link to sign up for that meetup. So no matter when you're watching this, there should be a meetup coming up in an area near you. So go ahead and click on those links anyways, even if this is years later, and see if there's a meetup near you. All right. All right, you guys. So let's get into it. We like to kick off the video with a prayer asking the Lord to come and be with us and guide us. So let's do that now. And if you will join me, regardless if you're live or recorded, join me because the Lord is out of time and space, meaning he's not limited by it, and he will know that you were praying with us, and uh, we, we just thank you so much for joining us in this fellowship. So, Almighty Jehovah, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we lift up one another today. As you said, pray for each saint, pray for every saint with prayer and supplication, asking the Holy Spirit to come in and give what is missing, show what is wrong, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and motivation to correct our ways, to change our ways from the way we have been going and the way that the world has taught us. Lord, we, we, may we move and repent and change the direction that we now face perfectly to you that we walk perfectly in your direction. Lord, we ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach that you would move our feet to the end you have, have already determined and already willed for us in this life. We ask, Lord, that you would also reveal to us your will every day more and within every moment of our life that we may rejoice in celebrating your will and doing your will, just as Yeshua celebrated and enjoyed and embraced your will. For all my brothers and sisters who are watching live or recorded today, Lord, I pray in the name of Yeshua that you would fill them, that they would truly feel the Holy Spirit enter into them, that they may know the hand of the true creator, the I am that I am, the Alpha and the Omega, the Father, the Abba Father is in them, and that they may feel that touch and know that it is your will and it is your power and it is your authority that cast out the darkness, that cast out the evils, uh, lies and deceptions, and brings us through the fire of refinement into your kingdom, into your bosom, into your relationship, that we may be ambassadors to have an amazing testimony about a life we live with you and an eternity we will spend with you. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name we pray and give thanks forever. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love Yeshua. Yes, I do.
I just like to break out in song once in a while, in case you don't know that. Nathan Wheeler just breaks out in song sometimes. It's kind of crazy. Just have to deal with it. So the first one on the list to be read today ties in with what we were talking about yesterday. Each day builds upon itself, folks. So if you haven't seen the days before, may I, may I welcome you, of course, to watch today's video, but also go back and check out uh, the videos before in order so that you can understand the references of the days before and things like that. We do want you to uh, have a full understanding. We don't want anybody to, um, we don't want anybody to, you know, be uh, left behind. I didn't want to use that word, but that was the only term I could think of. I didn't want to reference the movies. <laughs> so yeah. We don't want anybody to be left behind. So anyways, you get what I'm saying. Okay, Galatians 3, 5 is the first thing that we're going to read today. As I said, it will tie in with the passages yesterday. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. I love how much the Gospels keep telling the exact same message. They, the, the, they keep rewording it so that when the devil's little lie comes into our ear... It, 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 and he tries to twist it and maneuver it and make it seem like it isn't what it is. The apostles did such a great job and, and the disciples did such a great job in writing so that we could have that fight against the devil's lies. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Remember, earthly nature is exactly what Paul called the inheritance uh, of our ignorance and also what Psalms called. So it's not just Paul. Paul's referencing uh, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and Psalms, where it talks about the inheritance of ignorance is what we are born into. Earthly nature is the term they also use. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. So it's saying you will have desires to do evil. And you're thinking to yourself, really? I actually want to do evil? Well, evil is anything that goes against God's will, anything that goes against God's commandment. So yeah, it's crazy how much we actually do desire to go to, to, to want things and to seek after things that are against God's will. So we actually do have evil desires in our flesh, in our earthly nature. And of course, the, the next one is greed. And all of these things, I love this, which is idolatry. So yesterday, you know that we talked about how many of us, when we read the Old Testament and the New Testament, I guess, yeah, yeah I mean, it, this is in the New Testament, but when we're reading the Old Testament, especially, and we hear about the Jews, they keep having these trinkets and these statues and they, and they have these other gods that they worship and they have a God for every little thing that they pray to, like the Romans and the Greeks did, right? There's whatever it was, they had a God for a specific thing. They could pray to that God and that God would take care of that issue. And yesterday I had said that we have these gods in our life today, but modern people don't think that they do. But anything that we put our trust and our faith in to either help us have a better trajectory, right? A better direction in life that we are going, trajectory that we're going in life, where we say, okay, if I do A, B, C, then I have a better chance of achieving D. Right. This is very much what we do and what we have as gods when we build up things like pride and jealousy and greed and envy and unforgiveness and guilt. Right. These things are our idols. They are our other gods. But we don't think of them as that. And I had talked about this yesterday as we went over that. And I know that sometimes the devil comes in after the video. You're laying there in bed and going, well, that's not really an idol, right? Because it's not like I worship this thing. It's accidental. I didn't mean to do it. It's not like I'm happy about the fact I have unforgiveness. It's not like I'm happy about the fact that I have, you know, um, impure thoughts, right? Hmm. But here it is. Galatians 3, 5, which is idolatry. These things that have been listed are indeed idolatry. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the Bible says right here, if you have these things in you, if you have these things uh, uh, birthing and staying in you and you will not release them, they are idols. Isn't that crazy? So just in case you were wondering if, if Nathan was using liberties. Nope. It's in the Bible. Okay. Here's something that should also encourage you. 
Oh, what, what is this? Oh man, hold on one second. I forgot to put. Okay, this is 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6. No, 2 Corinthians 7, 11. Okay, sorry guys. Uh, my notes, I think, got messed up. Let me just double check. Let's see. Sorry, hold on one second. 7. Yeah, it's 7, 11. Okay. I apologize. I didn't give myself my own notes. Yes, 7 11. 2 Corinthians 7 11. Okay. All right. As you've been going through this, is, I think this is perfect timing for the day 32. This passage is perfect timing for day 32 for those of you who actually have gone and really given it 32 actual days. This whole experience has had an effect on you one way or another. One way or another, you have made the choice to look into yourself, find the things uh, that you may be doing wrong or be open to the things that are keeping you from having a greater relationship in Jehovah. I don't want anybody thinking that this 40 day challenge is Nathan's way of kind of basically kind of saying or trying to hint that people who have been walking with Christ or believing in Christ don't have a relationship with him. Nope, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that if you have taken up this cross and you have said, I am going to really search myself. I am going to take captive my thoughts. I am going to put on the helmet of salvation. I'm going to watch myself and stalk myself like a lion. If you've done this, you will have had an experience that is probably, and I'm, I'm using that just as a clause, just to, as a, not to offend anyone, because I know that you will, you will have an experience. Now, what I like to talk about is the fact that this is what is being discussed in 2 Corinthians. It's this level of experience of those who really fight and really seek to actually shed off their, their earthly nature, their old inheritance of ignorance. Okay, so just this will speak to you now. I know you may not need that buildup, but it's also just for anybody who's watching that's, that is just tuning in. I don't want them to uh, think... I want to encourage you all to go through this through it and I believe that these passages will mean something different by day 32. This is my point. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. This challenge, this suffering, this being shown all your ugliness, all your sins, all the ways and all the things that you collect and all the things that you've gathered and all the things that are actually idols to you. Yes, this has not been fun, maybe. Maybe this hasn't have been so pretty. Maybe this is a lot bigger than what you originally thought. But do you see what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, earnestness is a great word. We don't really use it anymore. You're just, it's just an authenticity. You, you just, you're not lying to yourself. You have actually removed lying to yourself by doing this process. You have learned to not lie to yourself anymore and just take a good hard look at who and what you really are. And in fact, the better you take a good hard look at who and what you really are and what you really want and the choices that you make, the more of a, of a reward has been produced. Yes, it also is a lot more ugliness has been added to the list, but it also produces a bigger reward. What eagerness to clear yourselves, to clear yourselves. It's as if Paul is literally talking about the 40 day challenge, isn't it? He is saying this godly sorrow has produced an eagerness to make you want to clean yourselves even more. The more that you sought to clean yourself, the more ugliness showed up, the more ugliness showed up, the more you, you, really strived and fought with it and had that dark battle with it. And then you realize you can't fight it, which actually the devil would use to beat you up. Is this, is this kind of the arc in the beginning that a lot of people experienced? You're like, okay, let's take a look at it. This is going to be exciting. Oh my gosh, this list of my bad ways is huge. Oh my gosh, I'm really far away from God. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to accomplish this. I'm totally not one of those holy people. I'm totally not one of those people on TV or on the internet that have their stuff together. And they're just obviously God just made them better people than me, right? And so the devil uses it to attack us. So then we fight through it. We push through it. Sometimes we even have nights or days where we cry through it legitimately. We get angry and punch pillows through it, right? 
and what it produced in us as we as we surrendered more and more because we learned that that is actually the trick. We do actually have to surrender. If we do not surrender, we will never defeat our inherited past and our inherited nature. We won't, we can't. That is who we are until we create a new habit to stay in the pause and to give it over to Yeshua. And then as we give it over, we notice something very real happens that the Bible promises. And this is where, if you will, I don't like to use this word because of its modern day negative connotation, but something very magical does indeed happen. We get to a point of utter brokenness that ironically, the devil had a hand in. He had a hand in showing us the list of our ugliness. He had a hand in telling us that we will never be you know, able to fix it. It's too much, it's too big. But the spirit inside of us and the, and the believing the king through the fire, just believing in the king through the fire was accounted onto us as righteousness. And the Lord reached through the fire. And when we were like, I don't have the power, I don't have the ability, he brought us gently through. Every day more, every moment a little bit more. And we actually began to trust in this word and in this concept of surrender. And as our list got naturally lighter, it, more and more things were taken off daily. And actually the desire to even want to do the things of our old natural way actually went away a little bit more every day more, every day more. And as we began to taste what is promised onto us, which is freedom, because now we're in the truth, we actually became eager eager now to bring up more junk, bring in more of those, those, those sins and those stumbling blocks and those strongholds in our life. Now we're like, I actually believe that what the scriptures are saying are true, that God will indeed just see my faith and make that the thing that gives him the, the wanting to reach into the flame, grab me and slowly pull me through at the rate he knows I can handle, at the temperature he knows I can handle. And the fact that I now am experiencing it, my faith is increasing that this is actually a very real thing. And then we go to the scriptures like this today, and when you read it, you're like, oh my goodness gracious, this is so exactly what we are experiencing here in the 2000s of the 40 day challenge that it proves to me this is the real deal even more see what this godly sorrow has produced in you what earnestness what eagerness to clear yourself what indignation what alarm indignation ew alarm oh my goodness I'm really jacked up. Oh my goodness, I have a lot of junk attached to me. Oh my goodness, I'm really far away from God. What longing, I'm really far away from God turns into, but I really want to be closer to God. I'm so tired of being away from Him. I'm so tired of, of, of not being close and I want to be on His feet. I want to dance with Him in the gala. I want to be in His presence. It produces that longing because we are no longer lying to ourselves we become earnest we're no longer lying to ourselves saying that i go to church every sunday i raise my hand say i believe i read a passage here and there and i know i am saved and in relationship with god but when we're earnest and we really take a look at it we become eager to actually deal with what is really there that we've been lying to ourselves about. It produces indignation. We end up hating the fact of it. anything is separating us from the Lord. We become alarmed that we're so far away from him and we begin to really long for it to be closer to him. What concern, what readiness to see justice done. We want to see the enemy squashed. We want to see the victory. We want the reward for the suffering of going through the refining fire. We are so ready to see the victory. We are so ready for the burning flame to no longer hurt and for the pain of what's being ripped away from us that we've built and grown attached to. We want it to be done with. We want to see justice done. We want this to be done with. At every point, you have proven yourself to be innocent in this matter. So in you doing this, Paul is talking actually, just to be clear, Paul is talking about how there was false, two false prophets in this group. 
and how as these two false prophets began to teach false teachings, it actually caused basically a fight, a physical fight, and some people got hurt in this fight. And he says, I just want you to know that we, the apostles and his disciples, do not, um, do not uh, I hold you all accountable. We're not saying it's all your fault. We know who the corporates uh, the, uh, of the of the of the uprising of the fighting of the you know um, un, the breaking of the peace in the group is. And he says we don't hold you accountable. Uh, we we understand that you're innocent of this fight that happened. But does it not also apply? At every point, you have proven yourself to be innocent in this matter. At every point, so at every stage of this journey, you are receiving innocence from the Lord as he washes you clean. And as you surrender, instead of thinking to ourselves that we were born innocent, which we weren't, right? But we become innocent as we continue to do what is right. And that is a pretty amazing idea right? We, we are proving ourselves to receive his innocence, right? Hear me out here. If you take the truth of the sentence, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That means that all the things, if you get to that point, right? It, all the things that you are, all the things that you think, all the things that you are physically doing throughout the day are not you doing them. You, are, you have basically become a, a grand master, if you will, of surrender. You surrender moment to moment to moment to moment to moment, and you allow the Holy Spirit to come in. And in so doing, you are living a life of innocence because you're no longer allowing the ways of the world to be involved in your day. You are living a life of innocence. It, you, you, you will, do, as some of you don't know, we'll probably get to this, and I should find it right now, but right before Paul walked, I've ran the good race. This sentence is really, really, is really, really important. No one has anything against me. Now, do you think that there was nobody living who didn't have a, a family member or a friend uh, or somebody they knew who Paul did not arrest and persecute and bring to their death? I imagine there's somebody who's living when Paul's walking to his death that he did indeed act as Saul as a, persecu a persecutor and therefore, um, you know, their, their murderer, if you will, because they were Christians, right? Paul confesses this. We're not saying anything bad about Paul. We're just talking about who he was before he became a new creation. And Paul says this thing at the end of his life, right as he's walking to getting his head chopped off, knowing he's getting his head chopped off. And he says, nobody has anything against me. I've ran the good race. I've done it. And you think to yourself, wow, well, he's Paul, so I guess he has the right to say this. I guess he has the right to say that basically he's clean now. And the Bible says, as we heard earlier, as it is in them, so it is in us. As it is in Christ. Well, Christ was innocent because he lived his entire life, moment to moment to moment, only in the Lord's will, only doing and, and, and wanting really the Lord's will. He did want the cup to pass from him, but in all in actuality, he said, but the thing I really want is for your will to be done, not mine. But if this is possible, then I will want that. I'll receive the cup passing from me. Well, Paul here says that in the new him that he was in Christ, when he lived moment to moment to moment, that when he finally got to the end of his life, the new him had surrendered over his moments moment to moment to moment so well so strongly so 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 wonderfully that he says nobody has anything against me because he acknowledges he's a new him this is such an important sentence guys i know i'm being long-winded but hear me out here the devil will always want to bring up what this shell experienced before your new birth the devil will always want to bring up the track record and the past of what this shell you were born into, this vehicle you're walking on earth, he will always wanna bring it up and he will always be wanting to tell you, this is who you are, this is who you really are. So when we read this, and we read that we are actually able to move into innocence, that we are able to move into a state where we can say, nobody has anything against me. Think about that sentence. 
do you think that there's not anybody in the world who had a grudge against him or was not maybe had unforgiveness in their hearts towards him? But he was saying, that is no longer me. That Paul, whose name was Saul, is dead. The man who lives now is Paul. And he's saying, as Paul, I didn't do those things. Paul never arrested any Christians and killed them, right? Paul never did the evil things that he, he had done as Saul. So, so this is a really important thing to take from the gospel, guys. That if the devil is sitting there saying, I'm never going to flee from you, which is what we talked about yesterday. I'm never going to flee from you. You're not that good. You'll never be this good at, at, at being holy. He's right. We never will be. But if we do become stronger and stronger of saying, Lord, teach me how to surrender, move in me and, and, and show me how to surrender, Yeshua will do. The Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh will do what it has been doing already, maybe in little steps and little pieces of these 32 days so far. But for the rest of your life, it's going to continue to strengthen you. And there will come a day, the Bible promises, where the devil will flee from you. And you may even indeed have the ability to say, as you enter into your, your death, nobody has anything against me. I've done it. I've run the good race. That's an amazing, amazing promise of the Lord. That's an amazing thing from scripture to really take in hand. So I hope that if you, I know I'm putting a lot of pieces here together, but I'm just trying to help through the spirit, dry the cement of the truth that you've already heard. Because the devil's going to want to change its shape before it, it dries. He's going to want to leave some kind of back door, some kind of window unlocked to the home so he can come in and steal your joy. And I'm just like, you know, we're speaking against that today. We're not going to allow the devil to come in and give his little twisted versions of it and say, no, Nathan really didn't mean idols as in like you worship other gods. No, it's not really that we'll actually be so clean and so right walking with the Lord that that the devil will flee from us. Of course, he doesn't want us to believe in that one. Mm, but my brothers and sisters, I tell you, it's the truth. And I tell you it's the truth, not because Nathan says it's the truth, but because it's in scripture. And my father God cannot tell a lie. Okay, I'm gonna read to you uh, all of 2 Timothy 2. Um, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna break it down. I just gotta follow the spirit here, but I think this is gonna speak to you guys. And I think it's going to bless you. So here we go. If you need to take a pee break, maybe now's the time. Press pause. I don't know. Uh, hopefully it won't be too long. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Yeshua. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Yeshua. Paul is saying, join me in suffering. He doesn't say, join me in law. Join me in, you know, kicking back, kick up your feet, enjoy the sunset, collecting riches. No, he says, join me in suffering like a good soldier. Notice the Bible's constantly calling us sheep and soldiers, which is kind of weird but we are to be sheep on earth and soldiers in spirit. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Who? Okay, this is important for the future, guys. This is, this is a, uh, we're starting to address the setup for the slippery slope of pride. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather ties to please his commanding officer. Our commanding officer is the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tells us what to do when we surrender moment to moment to moment. We say, Holy Spirit, come in and tell me exactly what to do, exactly what to think, exactly what to believe. Will we do it perfectly? No. But right now we're in boot camp and we're beginning to see the benefits of this boot camp. We're beginning to see the benefits that a skill set we never thought we would have, we actually are seeing signs that we're earning and we're gaining and we're coming into. Similarly, on anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. If you think that you can cheat this, if you think that at any moment you can step into the race 
and that there's going to be some kind of shortcut you can take to win this race or to skip through the hard stuff, you will not get the victor's crown, our brother here is saying to us. That's really important for the slippery slope of pride that might be coming for all of us when we begin to pick up our cross and begin to experience the benefits of holiness and the benefits of the Holy Spirit, okay? This, the fruits of the Spirit. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Who is the hardworking farmer, right? That, that would be those who, are, the, those who are going out. Basically what we would call today pastors, ministers, who go out and are the teachers, okay? He's saying if they're the ones uh, plowing the field and really making hard for everybody, they're really trying to bring the entire farm up, right? They should be the ones to receive a share of, of the crops first. Uh, basically, he's saying you honor them. There's another passage in the Bible that says where one of us is honored, the entire body of Christ is honored. So basically, he's saying also keep your ego in check and don't think you're greater than your teacher. Reflect on, now he's Paul, so you know, it makes sense that he's also saying this. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Meditate on this, think about this. God's going to make this un understandable to you. Remember Yeshua Christ raised from the dead. Um, English is kind of rose. He himself rose from the dead, descended from David. He is a descendant from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Okay. We talked about how the devil will flee from you. But does that mean that life is going to become smooth sailing? This is where false doctrine really can come into the world today. This is where false teachings can come in. That, that, that having a life of struggle means that you are not right with God. Having a life of, of, of pain and suffering and uh, disasters, his boats crashed, he's been stoned, he's been whipped, he's been arrested, he's even been labeled a criminal. Brothers and sisters, how many of us look to somebody who's been arrested, look to somebody who has, who has been accused of a crime, and we immediately change our, perce our perception of them, our perspective, our opinion, and we immediately go, oh, they're not who we thought they were. This person is not as holy or as righteous because a holy righteous person would never, cre would never commit a crime. But because Paul is actually doing something so good, and he has reached apostle level obviously he's been anointed as apostle level which is obviously the absolute a human can achieve uh on earth he's actually been arrested as a criminal and remember yeshua was arrested as a criminal too and we know he was sinless so this is this is the world hates us and christ said that the world will hate you as it hated me the world will kill you as it killed me even for my namesake you will be persecuted and you will be killed right and so this is this is i don't want anybody to think that when when it says the devil's going to flee from you that means that life becomes smooth sailing that every time you go and buy a lottery ticket you're winning every time you you uh you know you go for that job interview you win the better job right that's not what this is saying it's saying that you will not be disheartened you will not be uh, to the point where you go, I give up on you, God, or I can't do this anymore, or I'm not sure I can believe anymore, right? You will know in the future when the world does come against you, if it comes against you, when it comes against you, that you will say, I rejoice in this because I'm storing up heavenly treasures. I am, I am becoming wealthier in heaven as the world attacks me because this is proof I'm actually doing right totally weird flipped concept here right so that's what he means when he says but god's word is not chained the world may chain you in your body the world may may hinder you or come against you in an earthly tone in an earthly fleshy way but that doesn't mean that god's word is chained that's really really important as you move into holiness as some of you have already begun to experience the world seems to actually come crumbling down around you sometimes or come against you. Um, people that you love for no reason seem to want to create false lies, like false uh, accusations about you. And, and, and there's just all sorts of things that, that seem to go wrong, right? But, and then what the devil tells us is goes, see, 
that scripture is not for you. See, you're not the holy one the Bible's talking about. See, you're not the one that, that I'm going to flee from. He wants to reiterate here, but God's word is not chained. Just because of these circumstances, don't let the devil think that that means that, that, that for one person the Bible is true, and then for you it's not. This passage is true for these people over here, but for you it's not. Does this make sense? He's totally really addressing this, and he's saying, look at me, look at me as an example. I've been beaten, I've been stoned to death a couple of times, I've been shipwrecked three times, I've been in prison many years, even as labeled as a criminal. So, so really, folks, take into to what the apostles and what Christ went through and understand that you are indeed the chosen one. You are indeed the one that God has, 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 has said, come to me and receive my spirit that I may live in you and run that good race. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. What an amazing passage to come next. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the others. Paul is the one that said, account others as more significant than yourself. Here he is saying that when the world seems broken, when everything comes against you, when everything is crumbling away, when it seems like you have really bad luck or that God has abandoned you and it seems like, like, you're, like God is almost saying, well, well, are you walking right? I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to put you back into the fire and you're like, why? I've given everything up. I'm trying to surrender. And he says, don't think that God has become a liar, that the scriptures are a liar. And also understand that we do this not for ourselves, but we endure this because it is a testimony unto our brothers and sisters in Christ. Endure everything for the sake of the elect. I love that he makes it clear you're not doing this for yourself. What a great opportunity to smash the opportunity of pride. Why? That they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Why? Why are you suffering earthly things? Why would you suffer human attacks and human uh, lies and being labeled as a criminal or a bad person? Lies. Like, why would, why would you endure this? joyfully why would you continue to proclaim the gospel that doesn't seem by outsiders to be applying to you where is your god how many times have, have was that said to the apostles and to yeshua himself if you are the son of god take yourself off the cross Woo! that takes a big giant you know what right you gotta have a lot of guts to say that to Yeshua when he's on the cross. If God, if you really of God and he really is your God, take yourself off that cross. Woo! But why did he endure the cross and why didn't he come off the cross? He said, nobody kills me. I give up my life willingly. Why? That they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Yeshua with eternal glory. The number one thing, folks, that you are here on earth for, I just want to make sure that, like, as a brother, I really drill this home. You're going through this. I know we're at day 32. You may even be thinking this is a little early, Nate. It's a little early for me to be thinking about what it's going to be like for me when I'm holy rolling. It's a little early for me, right? I'm still looking at my list that keeps coming up. It's a little early for me to be thinking what it's going to be like when I'm going around laying on hands and blessing and speaking prophecies and moving in the spirit and raising the dead. It's a little early for me. No, because it's the journey between now and then where the devil is going to begin to put some really nasty roots in you. It's the journey between now and then that as you do get closer to the Lord, as you do gain more freedom from the, from the sins that pull, as you do gain more peace and more rest from the, from the desire of the evil ways, you're going to also become more confident. And the Bible is constantly reminding us. The passage we read yesterday it, from Yeshua, he says, even do not, do, not be, uh, do not rejoice in the fact that you can lay hands on. Do not get excited about the fact that you can lay hands on and cast out demons. He literally says that. Don't, get, don't, don't even rejoice about it. Don't get excited about it. He says the thing to remember is that your name is written in the book of heaven. That's the thing to rejoice in. That's the thing to keep your focus on. And here's Paul. And he's saying, I can boast in my suffering. I can boast in the fact that I've been chosen by Jehovah to do this. 
I've been, I've been, I got all these things going against me. Not only have I won the mindset that as my world crumbles around me, I've won the strength and have proven to have an apostle's mindset that I am able to say the word is the truth and these truths spoken by the Lord are onto me. He, he's winning the good race in being persecuted and keeping his faith. Does that make sense? He's winning the race because while the world hates him, he's rejoicing and still believing in the words. That is his victory moment. He's saying, I could boast here. I could live and go look at me and how great I am. But he says, I endure all these things, all these sufferings. My focus is clear that I'm doing it so that you might be saved. So that you who witness me and watch me might be saved. This, my brothers and sisters, I pray in the spirit right now in Yeshua HaMashiach's name, becomes your motivation as you move out of the flame of refinement. I pray that your motivation not be, look at me, I made it to the other side. Lord, give me all your treasures. But that you truly understand that you came through the other side so that you would be the ambassador who turns back around and sticks your hand in the flame and grab as many as you possibly can. Truly, truly, always authentically make others more significant than yourself for their salvation, for their salvation, not for the betterment of their life, not for just speaking and making them feel all warm and fuzzy and cozy inside. No, my brothers and sisters, that they too may enter the flame, that they too may be arrested and be labeled as criminals, that they too may know the struggle of the world colliding around them yet maintaining the faith that the passages are true. This is what God wants you to do. He wants you to help your brothers and sisters get to this point. Here is a trustworthy saying, trust in this what you're about to hear. If we died with him, we will also live with him. Notice how it doesn't say, because you believe you're gonna live a rosy, cozy life. It says the worst thing that according to the world can happen to you if we die with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Well, I want to reign with him, not because I think I'm worthy, but that just sounds really nice. I want to live with him. So if that means I have to die onto myself every day, I have to endure for the rest of the breaths in these set of lungs. If that's what I have to do that I may live with Yeshua, I will count it all glory. Not just onto myself, not just because, yes, my name is written in the book of life, but I will count it glory because I know that it will be an inspiration and a tool that Jehovah used to bring more of my brothers and sisters into the kingdom. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we disown him, if we give up on him, if we believe the lie of the devil and say, yes, you're right, my life sucks, this hurts, this is more than I can bear, therefore, of course, God's word does not mean me. If we think to ourselves at any moment, the word of God does not apply to me. The promises of those who surrender and seek and allow him to come in and endure the suffering of life will have their reward. If we get so beaten down, if we allow the devil to, to say these lies and we begin to believe them, we are disowning Yeshua's truth. We are disowning God's promises and he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he though will remain faithful. He cannot disown himself. What that means is, is even though we lose faith, even though we proclaim that the word of God doesn't apply to us, even though we proclaim that God's word isn't applicable in every situation, even though we proclaim it, that doesn't mean that God will ever take his hand off his words, that his promises will ever lose his power. He cannot disown himself. He cannot go against what he has already spoken. Dealing with false teachers. Keep reminding, and this isn't what this passage is about. It's going to speak more to, 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 the, to the walk coming up. Dealing with false teachers. Keep reminding God's people of these things. You. You keep reminding yourself and you keep reminding people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. This is where your pride will most likely have a chance to shine as you move into holiness and as you finish reading the entire Bible. This is where a lot of people who are educated end up gaining this big 
fat, crazy suitcase of pride. I know the Lord had to bring me through this lesson in a very, very hard way. It's one that I, if you've heard me for the last seven years, you know that there is one sin that I am the most paranoid about. So much to the point where I will, I will even not even try to fight the other sins in my life because there's one sin that is so sneaky and so tricky. And I'm just like, this is the one that got me before to the point where I didn't even know it was there. I didn't even know I had it. And that is pride. Pride in what I was doing for the Lord. Pride in what I had been given in the freedom and the truth of the Lord. I took the good he gave me and I became prideful with it. This to me, and this, and according to the scriptures as we're reading, is the, is, is the slipperiest of the slopes. And as you move into holiness, he's talking to this people. He's saying, you've done good. You're going to move into innocence. You're going to have these things. This is all going good for you. But you know what? You can also break it and you can also use it for bad. Keep reminding pe God's people of these things. Warn them. Warn them. God's people, not non-believers, God's people, the ones who receive Christ. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value. If there's anybody who could debate words of God, it was Paul. It was Paul. Paul could have done this. He's proven himself to know the scriptures very well and have understanding of the scriptures very well and he says right here to be able to do what he has the gift to do is of no value so what would allow any of us to come into holiness to read the entire bible and study it to find ourselves approved right and then to take that and then we think that it's that it was all so that we could turn around and go tell everybody else how wrong they are, that we could turn around and point out how wrong everybody is and how their theology is wrong and how what they're doing is wrong and how they don't really know the scriptures and how they don't really know God. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. <clears throat> why would the devil want, why would the devil have this last bomb that he puts in our suitcase? Why would he have this last secret bomb that looks like, you know, a teddy bear, you know, that we have in our suitcase that we bring across? We, we, we don't even know it's a bomb. We bring it through the flame. We're dancing with Yeshua. We're celebrating in the glory of God. And when we get there, we go, now I can boast. Now I can tell the world how wrong they are. Now I can tell the world how they don't know the scriptures. You can spend your entire life doing that. And when you speak that, you're speaking ruin onto their souls. You're not actually freeing them. You're not actually bringing them up to Yeshua. You're not actually bringing them into relationship with Jehovah. My brothers and sisters, this is an evil like I've never seen in the world. There is no greater evil than taking the gifts of the Lord and the words of the Lord and using it as a weapon against the innocent or the ignorant. Am I making sense? This is the greatest of all evils. This has done more harm to humanity than any bomb or any weapon created by mankind. This is the most devastating thing humanity has ever seen. This is why today in the 2000s, so many people don't know their father. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, okay? How? How, Paul? What am I about to do? What are you about to tell me that I need to do to be approved onto God, to present myself approved? Like, I've done what you've asked. How? A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Two things, my brothers and sisters. Paul says, Present yourself unto God as one approved by doing two things. No need to be ashamed. Remove as much of the junk as you possibly can in your life. How? We've already gone over this, which is to surrender moment to moment to moment. If you surrender moment to moment to moment, you're going to get to that place like Paul did. Nobody has anything against me. I have shown that I've learned how to run the race. I've shown that I've learned how to obey the rules. I have nothing to be ashamed of. He's telling us right here what it was that allows him at the end of his life to say, I have nothing to be ashamed of, nothing, no matter what my past was, arresting and killing Christians for being Christians, I'm not ashamed of it. 
I have learned to become a new creation. I've learned how to surrender. And the second part is when I learned how to do that, correctly handles the word of truth. Handles. Notice he doesn't say correctly knows the word of truth, correctly quotes the word of truth, correctly sermons the word of truth. You, you handle it. You apply it in the way that the Lord means for us to take it and apply it. I'm going to tell you the secret of that right now. This is throughout the Gospels. On this one, we'll probably go over it at some point, but it's humility. Humility is the correct way to handle the word of truth. Make sure that you find others more significant than yourself. That you realize everything you endure is for the sake of others and not yourself. Do not seek treasures here on earth for yourself. Seek treasures in heaven, which is your brothers and sisters souls. Have you ever heard that before? Because I'm telling you the truth that that's what it is. Your brothers and sisters souls are the only treasures that can be brought in to heaven. That's the only treasures. Our soul. All we can do is make sure our soul gets in. That's it. We, we're only accountable for one soul, and that's our own. We make sure that we run the good race. We make sure we pick up our cross and follow him. We make sure that we surrender moment to moment as best we can. That is our own soul. But we also know that when we do that, we are being a beacon of light, a cup that overflows for the sake of other brothers and sisters to be encouraged and inspired that they may enter. And as we suffer for the sake of doing this, we do it. We suffer joyfully knowing that we are indeed inspiring and serving our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the correct way to handle the truth. It is not to quote scripture or to throw law or to claim law in this and that or to quote scripture and say, look at how sinful you are. Look at how far from God you are. Nope, that is not the appropriate way. Do not condemn, but inspire. Do not speak death but speak life and blessing. But even unto those who are sinning, even unto those who are lost, what is the good news? That while we were sinners, he died for us. Where's the condemnation? That's the good news. While we were sinners, he died for us. That he made a peace treaty for us to not only become friends, but princes and princesses and ambassadors of his power and authority. That's the good news. Where's the condemnation? I believe there's a sentence in the Bible somewhere, and I'm being sarcastic when I say this, there is no condemnation for those in Christ. But guess what? You needed Christ to come and not condemn you first in order for you to be in Christ. There's no condemnation for those in Christ. That doesn't mean that just because you walked through the flame, got through the flame, now you get to turn around and condemn everybody who's not in the flame. You were given non-condemnation as a gift while you were worthy of condemnation. Make sense? This is the correct way to handle the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teachings will spread like gangrene. Their, their, their teachings will spread like gangrene, which is deadly, of course. Among them are Hamanias and uh, Pilatus. And uh, these were the two false teachers I was talking about who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place. You know what's crazy? There's denominations in the world today that say that same exact lie. And ironically enough, it's addressed in the Bible. There's denominations that exist today that say the resurrection has already taken place. And Paul actually says these two guys are false prophets or false teachers, excuse me, for saying that. How does a false, how does a doctrine exist like that today when it's actually addressed in the Bible? They destroy the faith of some. They destroy the faith of some by spreading these lies. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. We don't have to worry. When we do what we do, we just need to inspire. It's never us that is the reason why somebody comes to Christ. They may say it was your testimony, it was your teaching, it was your understanding of scripture, but it wasn't, it never was. Because if we speak in the spirit, it's the spirit that's speaking out of our mouth holes. If it's us who do, it's the spirit doing out of us. If it's us who chooses, it's, it's the spirit choosing for us. So when people give credit and they honor us, right? If we get honored, we must not be 
as the ego monster the devil wants us to become and goes dang right i got through the fire dang right i learned all the scripture dang right i memorized it all dang right you respect me for what i am no all those things are a gift onto you your ability to know scripture your ability to understand scripture that's not because you're so smart you should address that it's because god revealed it to you you there's literally nowhere not one place in any of our walks where we should have an opportunity to gain an ego not one just because you have does not mean that you have the right to say yes that's me anything you have that is good in your life or a result of of you walking right or gaining spirit is because god, god moved it and did it for you everyone who confesses the name of the lord must be turned away from wickedness the Lord knows who are his and everyone who confesses, everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from their wickedness. Does this make sense, guys? You, It's not about you at any time. And every single person who hears the name Yeshua must walk the exact same walk that you're walking in this 40 day challenge. They cannot just stay in a raised hand and say, I believe I'll listen to you on Sundays and I'm good with Yeshua. No. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from their wickedness. But how will they know what that is? Unless they have a brother and sister who testify of the reward of doing so. Who testify of the reward of suffering for the kingdom's sake. Not their own sake. For the kingdom's sake. They suffer. Right? In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Meaning there's going to be people who, as some of you may think when you started off, well, that person is, you know, naturally holy. They were born just good people. I'm a piece of junk. I'm like the lowest of the low. And there's some people out there that are like, you know, they're rich or they're wealthy or they just got their stuff together. They just seem they got it. There's some people who seem just naturally super intelligent and they just get things, right? And then there's people who just not seem to get anything. And there's people who just seem like like they really struggle and they just seem like they have had a really bad run in with 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 life and life just always wins against them this is the analogy that he's talking about there are some that are gold and silver but there are also those of wood and clay in every house some are for special purposes and some are for common use those who cleanse themselves from the later will be instruments for special purpose made holy useful to the master prepared to do good to do any good of god so it, we have to remove ourselves from the people who love this world we have to remove ourselves right it might hurt us we have to remove ourselves but also we don't know which one of us when we are here when we look when we all look like a giant turd right we all look like a giant pile of poop right but when we burn through the fire what gets left behind is what the Bible says, I will refine you as silver and I will test you as gold. You will no longer be breakable and, and fragile clay and you will no longer be unbeautiful wood. You are going to now, whatever you were here is not what you are here, right? You are now going to be used as silver and gold. You're going to be used for the special purposes, no longer for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments of special purpose made holy yes you are going to be made holy it's called a holy a holiness challenge because you as you go through the refining fire and the more you surrender and give up yourself and move the lord in and allow his holiness to come in you are made holy mind blowing yes useful to the master you will are useful to the master prepared to do any good work we talked about how yeshua said they will do more than me and some of us are thinking that that means like you know the apostles and so forth and then we we really saw that it meant all of us he will prepare you to do any good work there's also the passage that says don't get excited and don't be rejoicing in the in 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 the laying of hands and the miracles and the casting out demons don't make it about that if you remain humble prepared to do any good work not i know i have this gift so i'm going to do it of my own device I'm going to take the spirit that is in me and I'm going to use it onto my own device, into my own wisdom, into my own application. I love that once again, the, the subtlety but yet power of Paul's use of words here. Useful, you're useful to the master, not you are the master. 
you are useful to the master prepared to do any good work. You're ready to do any good work.